Hello, my name is Nick Debra. I'm an independent educator and consultant in the fields of data visualization and dashboard design. And by way of a very brief introduction, I have been doing this kind of work, teaching data visualization and dashboard design for a long time in the before times, pre-pandemic. I've taught these skills to thousands of professionals just like yourselves. And I have a software background, but really this talk today is not gonna be about, about software. I'm also an author. I have two books that I'm working on, Practical Charts, which will come out in September, and Practical Dashboards, which will come out in 2024. As you can see here, I have a pretty broad variety of clients, public sector, private sector, insurance, pretty much everything all across the board. Today, though, I'd like to talk about a kind of a pretty fundamental question, right? <laughs> that maybe we don't perhaps think too much about, and, and, and I think perhaps we should, which is essentially what makes one chart better than another. And of course, as we all know, you know, people do disagree on, on this question, right? Whether chart A is better than a chart B, whether certain chart types are better than certain other chart types. And of course, it's always civil, right? We, we all know that. But uh, I think when people disagree on this question, right? You know, is this chart better or worse than this other chart? they often have very different reasons for believing that one chart is better than another. For example, people will often say that one chart is better than another because it's more precise, that it allows people to visually estimate and compare the values in that chart uh, more precisely than uh, perhaps an alternative design. And in fact, many data visualization studies are based on, on this, this idea, right? They measure how precisely people can visually estimate made and compare values in the chart. Or sometimes people will say, well, if a chart is quicker to visually process, that makes it better. And again, there are lots of data visualization studies that measure this, right? How quickly people will be able to read a given chart design compared to another. Or sometimes people will kind of argue for the opposite. If it's a chart that people kind of linger on, that to them indicates that it's better because it's, I guess, more engaging perhaps. Or especially in like data visualization competitions, for example, people will often say that a chart is better because it's more creative or perhaps more artistic or beautiful, or the data is presented in a more original way. And they'll say, well, that's a better chart. Others will kind of argue for the opposite. They'll say, oh, you know, this chart is better than this other one because it's simpler or perhaps more familiar, i.e. it doesn't show the data in a creative or beautiful or, or kind of unusual way. Yet others will say, oh, you know, this chart is better than this other chart because it's more versatile. It allows for a wider variety of insights to be sort of seen in the data or a wide variety of questions to be answered about the data. Yet others will say that, no, 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 a chart is better if it's more memorable. And, and actually, again, there are data visualization studies that, that will measure this, like how much information within a chart people are able to recall after the chart is concealed from their view. Yet others will say, no, 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 one chart is better than another if it's more obvious, if the key insights, the key takeaways are, are very evident in the chart. Whereas others, you know, again, will kind of argue the opposite, say, no, 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 that's actually a bad chart. A good chart is objective, it's neutral. It, it leaves all interpretation of the data up to the audience. And yet others will argue that a chart is better if it evokes an emotional response, like perhaps curiosity or outrage or sympathy, for example. So unless we kind of get one is better than another, right? And so the definition that I use of a good chart, which has served me well so far, is that a good chart does the job that it was created to do as quickly, comfortably, and safely as possible. So let's kind of break this down a little bit, right? What is the job of a chart? Well, basically that depends on the chart. And depending on the chart, its job could be to persuade the audience to do something or to explain something to the audience or get their attention or answer a question that they've asked or allow them to filter or look up values and on and on and on. In fact, there are a virtually unlimited number of different types of jobs that charts can have. And so, like I said, the job is different from one chart to the next. So how we evaluate whether a chart is good or not is going to be different depending on the chart. And so I want to come back to this definition because there's sort of a second part to this, right? This quickly, comfortably, and safely part. So what exactly does that mean? Well, to my mind anyways, a good chart 
can be read quickly. It, it requires as little time as possible for the audience to interpret. Now, sometimes our chart is just showing something that, that's a little complex. And so as quick as possible, it might be even be 30 or 60 seconds, or even perhaps several minutes, but it's always as quick as possible. Comfortably simply means that it requires as little effort on the part of the audience to get what they need need from the chart. They ideally are not being forced to perhaps learn a new chart type unnecessarily, if there's a simpler one that could be available, for example. And then safely, this simply means that it poses the lowest risk possible of the audience misinterpreting the data in the chart. And this is actually really important because there are a lot of ways that charts accidentally misrepresent data, even when the chart creator was not trying to deceive anyone. In fact, each one of these thumbnails represents a unique way of accidentally misrepresenting the data, and yet is the kind of thing that you'll see all the time, unfortunately, in the wild. So if that's what I consider to be a good chart, what about these other kind of definitions, right? Do they matter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it still matters, you know, how precise a chart is or how quickly it can be visually processed or how memorable it is. But I call these subordinate qualities. These are qualities that a chart can have that increase its odds of doing its job, right? For example, if a chart is more obvious, it's also perhaps going to be more persuasive if persuasion is the ultimate job of, of the chart. These are are not, however, what ultimately determine how good a chart is, in my opinion, anyway. Right? What ultimately determines how good a chart is, is, of course, does it do its job? So this might sound a little bit theoretical, but this does have, I think, pretty important implications in doing a job that's actually quite different than the way that most people think about charts, especially when they're designing charts, which is as visual representation representations of data. But if we consider that charts are graphics for doing a job, well, when we sit down to design a new chart, we're going to start with the question essentially of, do I know why I'm creating this, right? Am I trying to persuade the audience of something? Am I trying to explain something to them? Am I just trying to grab their attention, for example? Whereas if I think of a chart as a visual representation of data, usually the design process begins with, what's the best way to visualize this data? And I don't think that's actually a very helpful question to, to, to begin with, right? You want to start with the purpose of the chart, not necessarily the data. If we think of charts as graphics for doing a job, well, the main consideration in most of our design choices is going to be the specific job of the chart. So when we're choosing a chart type, and a color palette and the how wide or narrow to make the scales and making many other design choices, really the job of the chart is going to be at the center of those design decisions. Whereas if we think of charts as visual representations of data, then the main consideration in most of our design choices is going to be the nature of the data, whether it's time series or the breakdown of a total or, you know, distributions of values, for example. Now, Obviously, when we're making design choices, we have to account for the nature of the data. But ultimately, in my experience, the nature of the data simply constrains our design choices. But there are always many possibilities that remain. And when we're choosing from amongst those remaining possibilities, it's really the specific job of the chart that's going to guide most of our decision making there. If we're trying to compare two designs or decide if our chart is actually a good chart or not, we're basically going to ask ourselves, well, did it do the job that we created it to do? If it was a chart that was designed to explain something to the audience, did they understand what we are trying to explain to them? If it was a chart that was created to persuade the audience to take a given course of action, did they take that course of action? Ultimately, that's the gauge of how good the chart actually is, regardless of how precise it is or how memorable uh, or how quickly it can be interpreted, for example. Whereas if we think of charts as visual representations of data, how we're going to evaluate that, right? You know, well, we're going to ask ourselves, does the chart visually represent the data? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, all charts visually represent the data, even really bad ones. 
And so it takes a bit of a sort of a mental shift to kind of shift away from thinking of charts as visual representations of data and towards thinking of them as graphics for doing a job. And so, like I said in my, in my last point here on the left, this is gonna change the way in which we evaluate charts as well. If we use this definition that I'm proposing for a good chart, right? For example, if I were to ask you, is this a good chart? Now I know there's a whole bunch of you <laughs> who are leaping out of your chairs right now. And, and I'm not gonna get into the whole pie chart debate here, but in general, we can't answer that question without knowing what the chart is for. We don't know what the purpose of this chart is. However, if we were to assume that the, the purpose is to communicate that Mrs. Smith here contributed more than Mrs. Jones, well, I would say that this is a bad chart because it's, it's hard to compare these slices, right? There's, there's not enough precision essentially in this chart to see whether Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones had higher donations. They're, they're, they're too similar in size. However, if we assume that the job of this chart is to show that Mrs. Smith contributed almost a quarter of all donations, well, then I would say, yeah, this is probably a very good chart because it's very obvious that Mrs. Smith, you know, that slice is a little less than, than a quarter. And maybe I would want to enhance it by highlighting that, that slice, for example, or, or this one. Some of you may recognize this chart. It basically burned down DataViz Twitter last year. It was in the New York Times showing essentially the case count in the states of COVID over the course of a little over two years. And a lot of people love this chart. A lot of people hated it. And when I any other chart, I'm going to be asking myself, well, what is it for, right? What is the job of the chart? If the job of this chart were to precisely show case count trends over time, well, this is a bad chart, right? Because it's kind of hard to see it. It would be much easier if we unwrap the spiral and basically turned it into a standard line chart, right? However, if we assume that the job of this chart is to increase the odds that a reader will read the article, which was below it, well, this is probably a really good chart. It grabs your attention, it kind of draws you in. And so again, depending on what the job of the chart actually is, that's going to really ultimately determine how good or bad it is, right? We have to kind of know what the chart is for before we're going to start evaluating different chart designs. By the way, this talk is actually extracted from the introductory part of a course that I deliver called uh, Practical Charts. And I mostly deliver this in private workshops, but I do a couple of public ones a year. And so if you're interested in this kind of thinking, there's one coming up next month in June, and I've created a little discount code. You can get 15% off if you're attending the conference here at Outlier. Thanks very much. Uh, this talk was pre-recorded, but I am planning on, on attending the Q&A session live. And so I believe I will be available right after this to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks very much for listening. So I'll take a look at the questions in the chat in just a second, but um, I think a lot of us do have thoughts about this, um, but none of us mm -hmm. have taken the time to put together like a 20 minute presentation about it. So like, what was your source? Was there like a tipping point where you're like, you know what, we need to think about this differently. It's not working for me. Um, anything like that for you, a moment of aha, aha. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I suspect that it probably has a lot to do with my background. Uh, you know, I started out in, in the software industry. Uh, well, originally I was a coder, but I spent most of my time actually as a product manager. And so I was really learning to, of course, you know, design products that people would like and that would sell, of course. Uh, and then when I started getting into data visualization, I think I brought that maybe perspective with me and started thinking about charts really as products, right? As basically, you know, something that has to be useful um, and starting to really see the, the sort of the contrast with that view with maybe the prevailing view, right? The prevailing view, not, not that everyone had it, but a lot of people basically thought of charts, not as products, but as sort of, you know, these almost kind of abstract, um, you know, visual representations of data, right? Like what I talked about in the, uh, the video. Um, and so, you know, but I, I really started thinking, no, you know, I think really it's more useful to think about these essentially as products, right? As, as, you know, things that are designed to do a task, right? They're graphics with a job. Uh, and I know some people get, 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 they get kind of uncomfortable with that because they think, oh, you know, are you saying, for example, 
that you should just make charts say whatever you want them to say, right? You can make up the job and, you know, uh, and so that's really not what I'm saying. Uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe I should have added a little bit about that in the talk, but really, uh, you know, it's not like you can make, you should make charts to say whatever you want them to say. You should always make design choices based on your best, most honest interpretation of the data and the best interest of the audience, right? Like if, for example, you create a chart that is, uh, you know, perhaps hiding a problem that you know the audience would want to know about, that's lying, right? Just like any other form of lying, just like lying by speaking to somebody or by uh, writing, you know, uh, writing an, e you know, uh, like a whatever untruthful email or something. It's it's no different. But I guess you know we have to recognize though that there's there really is, in fact, my view, no such thing as a chart that kind of just shows the data. We're always giving our interpretation whether we want to or not. Um, and so, you know, we might as well treat it that way as, you know, essentially this is a message that I'm giving you and I'm making a whole bunch of choices about, you know, how to design that chart and what chart type and whatever. And so essentially, you know, I'm creating something that is designed to do a job. So I might as well just tell you what that job is, in fact, in, in a lot of cases. And so I think that, you know, there are definitely people, other people who feel that way, but I think it's maybe a minority, uh, you know, especially when people come into data viz, they tend to think of it as, you know, I'm creating visualizations of, of or, or visual representations of data, as opposed to I'm creating graphics for doing a job. And so I can, and, but I see it in my workshop when I move people away from that and towards the graphics for doing a job, all of a sudden, not only do their charts become a lot better, a lot more effective, but it's also a lot easier to design charts. It's a lot easier to make those design choices about chart types and color palettes and all those things. That was a really long answer. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you for that. Um, so we did have a, a question come in from the audience. Do you have any tips for de defining the purpose of your charts? Perhaps some might have even multiple purposes. Yeah. So. Um, Really, unfortunately, there are no quick workarounds for this. You know, you just have to know really not just a lot about the data, but a lot about the audience. And this is where people often, especially people who tend to deal with data, you know, they have data in their title, they're data analysts or data scientists, they tend to want to kind of live in the data. And so one of the things that I teach in my workshops is you can't do that, really. You have to get out of the data and into the minds of the audience to know, like, what are their concerns? What are their problems? What are the things that they are, you know, what are their goals, their objectives? Because, you know, if you don't know that, then it's really tough to figure out what the job of a chart should be, right? Like, you know, should it, should it be highlighting a problem that the audience is going to want to know about, for example? And so, like I said, there's no, there's no shortcuts to this. You just have to know, of course, you have to know a lot about the data, but you also have to know a lot about uh, the audience and also, of course, the environment from which the data came. Like if you're, for example, you know, visualizing insurance data, you better know a fair amount about insurance, right? And so all these things, they do take time, right? Uh, and so like I said, there's not, not a lot of shortcuts, uh, but it takes time to learn about the domain of the data and to learn uh, about the audience and then start to sort of notice things that you think that are going to be useful to them essentially. And so that's where kind of the job of the chart uh, often comes from. Now, sometimes of course, the job of the chart is given to us directly. Like somebody asks us a very specific data related question. In that case, it's easy, right? The job of the chart is to answer that question, right? But oftentimes, you know, we have to come up with the job, right? The insight to communicate the question uh, to answer. And then to the second part of the question in terms of like, well, what happens when, you know, the chart has kind of multiple jobs, right? There are several things we want to say about the data. Unfortunately, the kind of the typical response is they try to, you try and create sort of, you know, the one chart to rule them all, right? It's going to answer all the questions that people might have about the data. It's going to communicate all the insights that just doesn't work right it's you know you end up often with what i call a spaghetti chart right there's like three different axes and five different data series because you're showing you know uh you know the percentage of uh expenses by year and also compared to you know the percentage of breakdown of the total and also by region and also by department and then it's just like it becomes this kind of overwhelming mess and unfortunately you do see this a lot and so one of the harsh realities i think of data visualization is that Charts have to be designed around typically a very specific job. You know, the job of the chart is to answer this question, is to communicate this insight. And if you have several things to say, even about the same data set, 
you're generally better off actually creating multiple charts, right? So we have this view that answers this question. And then we have this other view, even if it's the same data, but it's going to be a different chart type. It's going to be filtered in a different way or whatever. And it's okay. And then this one answers this other question or communicates this, this other insight rather than trying to, you know, create that, you know, one sort of monster chart, because the reality is, even if you try and do that, you try and create a chart that's going to answer all the questions and, and, you know, communicate all the insights, it won't, <laughs> there will invariably be actually questions that it doesn't answer. Right. Because even for a fairly simple data set, there are always literally thousands of potentially interesting things you could say about it. And so you have to be very kind of narrow and targeted and say, my chart is just going to answer this question, is just going to communicate this insight so that we don't end up with, with spaghetti charts. Between you and Anna, I didn't know how many Lord of the Rings references I could get in a data visualization <laughs> conference. And I'm not mad about it at all. Um, I hope think, somebody's uh, keeping score. <laughs> I think that uh, maybe we have one time for one more question. This one comes from Luther. It's kind of timely because we, he does want some time saving tips here. So um, mm. is there a user centered design approach to making charts and graphs that isn't too time in, uh, sensitive, intensive? Um, I would say no, <laughs> you know, kind of like what I was saying in the beginning, like, and oftentimes, of course, we want shortcuts. We want to be able to just step into a new organization, for example, or a new industry and start to be productive right away. That'd be great. But the reality is, I think, you know, it's just not possible. Like you're, you know, for example, if you don't, if you don't know what is kind of common knowledge within your organization or within your audience, then you're going to be showing them charts of things that they already knew and they're going to get bored. Um, you're going to miss patterns, for example, and relationships, which might be actually be really surprising, but you don't recognize it because you're not sure what is typical for, you know, for that organization or, or that, that situation. And so, yeah, like that's, that's the harsh reality too, is that, uh, you know, like I, I often compare creating charts to, to writing. And for example, if you were to hire a copywriter to come in and write, marketing copy for your organization, for example, or to write, you know, reports for senior management, would you expect that person to create useful writing right off the bat? It's like, no, they're going to have to, they're going to take a while, right? They're going to, it's going to take weeks or months for them to learn enough about that particular domain, that particular organization until they start to become productive. And it's the same thing, I think, with, with charts. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So before I let you go, I do need to know, do you have a favorite chart type? You've seemed to make a very compelling argument for pie charts. I wasn't <laughs> expecting to be like persuaded that sometimes you can use them and they're okay. So great uh -oh. job. Right. I mean, <laughs> do you have a favorite or any, any that jump out? Is um, you always rely on? Yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is no. Although I did write an article last year with a very clickbaity title called my favorite chart type. But it was, it was, you know, like I said, it was just clickbait because the, the conclusion of the article was essentially that I think that, you know, a goal of people, you know, data visualization designers should actually be to let go of our favorites because it's kind of like having favorite words, right? And then, but then you tend to overuse them. You use them perhaps in situations where it's not appropriate to use those, those words. And so really, once you get really good at speaking, you will basically sort of, if you have any kind of favorite words, you'll, you'll let go of them and you'll always choose the, the mot juste, right? Like the, the perfect word for the given context. And I think that's very much the case with, with charts as well, uh, is that, you know, you, you want to, you know, not have favorites. You just want to basically kind of learn as much as you can about a quite a broad variety of chart types so that you know you have you know a lot of different chart types at your fingertips and you know when to use uh, each and that's that's not easy that also takes time you know like i in my practical charts course the one i mentioned in the video i i try to basically sort of reduce that to the smallest amount of information possible to create what i call good everyday charts and it contains 50 chart types you know, like, and, and so whenever I think that's always thinking, oh, can I cut any of these? It's like, no, like there are, you need to actually use all of these kind of fairly often. And, you know, that course is 14 hours long and the middle eight hours is just how to choose a chart type. And so, you know, like I said, that also takes time to learn not just about all these different chart types, but also when to use them. It's a lot more involved 
than I think a lot, a lot of people realize. But once you have a good handle on that, you'll find that you don't really have favorites anymore. You realize that there are just certain circumstances when it makes sense to use a pie chart or not, or a stack bar chart or a tree map or a strip plot or, or whatever, right? The trick is knowing what those circumstances are. And that's not a simple thing, right? It takes me eight hours to teach it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I love that, that it's more of a vocabulary that you're building, kind of like a lexicon. And then you, as you get older. Yeah. You yeah. I use that words. term a lot, like for, to describe what I teach in my course, it's the spelling and vocabulary of data visualization, because there are lots of analogies there, you know, like a chart with bad data vis, data vis spelling and vocabulary is like a text with bad spelling and vocabulary, right? It's hard to understand. You're going to be rereading sentences and, you know, and it's the same thing with a chart that has like poor chart type choices or poor color choices or the scales that are too wide or too narrow or is not, you know, the, the annotation is ambiguous, right? These are all what I call data viz spelling and vocabulary problems. Makes sense. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you being here. Definitely going to go find that article and throw it in the chat for you all. I'm sure you want to read it as much as I do. So uh, don't forget about his upcoming class and his books. Be sure to check him out. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today, Nick. And all right. Thank you. Thanks very much.